Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Miguel Perez. I am the head of public programming for the Phillips Collection, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to what I'm sure will be a really great conversation um, tonight. We are very fortunate to welcome Halim Flowers to be a part of the Phillips Collection. Uh, we approached Halim to reimagine our centennial logo uh, a couple months ago. We have asked 12 artists from the DMV to look at our Centennial logo and make it their own and reimagine it. Um, and along with this project, we are highlighting them through public programming. Um, some notable favorites that we've had in the past have been Trap Bob and Kelly Tows, and we are so lucky um, to welcome and have Halim be a part of this project for the month of July. Um, Halim is a visual artist, spoken word performer, businessman, and author of 11 published nonfiction works. Um, he is a father raising a family here in Washington, D.C. He is a part of the board of directors of the Frederick Douglass Project for Justice and Cultural D.C. here in Washington. Um, so we are very lucky and very fortunate to have him. Tonight, Halim will be in conversation with Sue Frank. Sue is one of our curators at the Phillips Collection, very knowledgeable on the history of the institution. Um, and from Halim's own request, tonight's conversation is all going to be about the history of the institution. So that's, Sue was a very natural, very perfect fit. Um, I am going to pass it off to the two of you guys. I will see you in about 30 minutes um, and have a great conversation. Hi, Halim. Hey, how you doing, Sue? Thank I'm you. good. Thank you for being present with me today. Well, I'm happy to meet you, you know, like face to face like this. And, you know, um, I just thought I would ask you to kind of get our conversation going because I know the logo that you made for mm -hmm. the Phillips, you know, I have it here in front of me, you Thank know. You. Um, it includes um, uh, the name of Marjorie Phillips, who was the uh, wife of our founder, Duncan Phillips, but it also includes, includes this name, Polly. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I just wanted to find out from you how you got interested in the Phillips Collection. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, what I wanted to talk to today to add to what Miguel said was not just the history of the institution, but yes. the history of women yes. in connection with the institution. And my story, um, serving 22 years of incarceration, and upon my release, um, my first introduction or support in the art world came from a woman named Dr. Sachiko Kuno and Kate Goodall from the Halcyon Arts Lab who awarded me the Halcyon um, Arts Lab Fellowship, provided me with a place to stay, a stipend, a studio. And they invited me to an event at the Krieger Museum where I met Helen Chasen, who was a director there who allowed me to use their um, library to personally study about the history of the arts. And then there I met Dorothy Kaczynski. And through meeting Dorothy and her husband, who is a law professor, who also has a love for poetry, is how I learned about the Phillips. Well, that's great, you know? And so, um... I was fascinated. I know I explained to you in the email that I sent you that, you know, you needed to kind of, you know, help me figure out Polly because not somebody that everybody, um, even at the institution, and I've been here for uh, 25 years, mm -hmm. would think of right off the bat. But you explained to me that it was, um, go ahead and, you know, tell everybody who it is. Yeah, Polly Fritchie, as, as we stated previously, was um, more than a socialite. I would like to say she was a philanthropist yeah. who had love for humanity and love for the arts. And she used her, her resources, her, her position to pivot um, the Phillips from being just, uh, uh, even though it was the first contemporary art museum in America, but it wasn't like nationally recognized. So she use her status and her resources to uh, put a professional gloss on the Phillips collection uh, and to give it national fundraising power and recognition. So what, what stood out to me when I learned about her, the first thing is that Majorie Acker, 
who his last name became Phillips, um, was the you know the wife of Mr. Phillips. Um, right. She was the artist herself. That's right. And then you know, and then, then Polly, um, who played this huge this huge role, the first non-family member to to be on the uh, the board of the trustees and. Um, but to me, she was like an unsung hero. And the reason why this is important to me, I know a lot of people may think I would talk about maybe black artists or, but I'm someone who is, who is a human first and an artist second. And I would not be who I am here today to access this Phillips uh, institutional platform had it not been for the women, starting with my mother and my wife, and all of the women who just supported me and nurtured me and got me to the space of day. So for me, any opportunity that I have um, to talk about art, especially with an institution like the Phillips, who is highly regarded and I highly regard their collection as well. Um, I, I just want to use my platform to help women because um, female artists are not paid equally. The curators are not. Um, they don't have equal representation on trustees, board of directors, um, directors of museums. So even though I'm a man and even though I could talk about the race issue as an artist, but you know, for me, I just think that I have to give some significant portion of my um, articulation of my experience in this art world to seeing that women are recognized who I believe should be. Well, I, I really appreciate your bringing up uh, Polly Fritchie's name because it really kind of opens up thinking about how women play really a variety of roles in institutions um, in salaried roles, you know, as part of an institution's employees or an individual like um, Polly Fritchie who was, you know, uh, a philanthropist, she had, you know, incredible uh, network of friends, um, including, you know, uh, the um, Lachlan Phillips, who was Duncan and Marjorie's son. And when he assumed responsibility as director in 1972 from his mother, you know, he was faced with a challenge of professionalizing this museum that his parents had built. Mm -hmm. and giving it a foundation to last um, into the future. And, you know, and so here we are, you know, 50 years later, and Polly really performed this incredibly significant role, you know, uh, being on the board of trustees, a leadership position in that regard, but also a national fundraising campaign, as you said. So, you know, she really is, you know, a leader that we don't necessarily always think about. And it really does kind of expand our um, understanding of, you know, how women philanthropists really can be, you know, essential figures in a museum. Uh, we still have, and you don't have to be on the board of trustees to go and have that kind of role. Um, we have our own director, you know, who is a woman, Dorothy Kaczynski, who's been an incredible leader um, these, um, I think like 13 years now that she's been um, head of the Phillips. And, uh, but another thinking about board members, you know, we had another um, significant woman play that role at the Phillips collection in the late nineties and into the 2000s, um, Vicki Sant. You know, another uh, woman, you know, her husband, Roger San, is still actively alive today, and they were incredible philanthropists, but Vicki was really the kind of uh, individual who um, engaged with museums because they spoke to her and that, you know, having, you know, um, working with and living with art because she and her husband created a collection was really important. You bring up an interesting thing about the Phillips with the women, you know, who have played these important roles. And Marjorie, of course, was like the kind of, well, she was the partner um, in this venture from the outset. 
since she married Duncan Phillips in 1921, right at the beginning of the museum as a public, you know, uh, place for people to come and gather. And she gained more, she was always important for her eye, but as um, their children grew older and as Duncan or Lachlan, their son, you know, became a teenager and Marjorie gained became more active doing uh, outreach into the community and writing to artists. Her role really has been um, not as, not as um, focused upon as it perhaps should be. Um, that I think you've hit on an important uh, aspect of like, looking more closely and kind of giving, you know, women who have, you know, Marjorie, for instance, was not just the spouse of Duncan Phillips, but she was his partner in this um, adventure, if you will. Uh, and there were other women. This is one thing that I have always been fascinated by at the Phillips and what I've come to understand is that um, as you mentioned about your own personal situation mm -hmm. with your mother having been an important figure in your life and now your um, wife is, you know, important, you have your family, that, um, and other people that, other women that have mentored you and inspired you. Uh, Duncan Phillips had a very strong mother who, um, supported him as he began this um, leap of faith to create this museum in the city of Washington at the end of World War I uh, and came to her and you know needed her um, approval to continue um, accessing his inheritance. But he, Duncan Phillips hired two women who were, who gave their life to the museum, who are the kind of behind the scenes women. One is a woman named Minnie Byers, who uh, was a financial advisor to Duncan's mother at, um, after she was widowed mm -hmm. and ultimately became uh, the assistant treasurer for the Phillips in 1923, 24. And then in 1927, when um, a gentleman named Dwight Clark retired, Duncan Phillips hired many buyers to be the treasurer for the museum. And she held that position until 1963 when she retired. Mm -hmm. And we know her role was so important in terms of advising the Phillips family and Duncan about the museum because she never, she advised him to keep his money out of the stock market. And so when the crash occurred in 1929, Duncan Phillips' wealth was invested in real estate in the District of Columbia. So he did not suffer the same kind of uh, negative effects that a lot of other wealthy individuals did. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just kind of putting into motion, you know, the importance of women at the Phillips collection is really something that we can see all the way from the beginning mm -hmm. and even uh, looking at Marjorie's role is so important um, in the, um, I mean, she is the first, she recognized Sam Gilliam's talent in the 1960s when he was still relatively new to Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, when she saw his work and she decided that, you know, he, uh, he should have a one person show. Mm -hmm. um, and so Duncan Phillips had already passed away and Marjorie is like picking up the, the reins of the museum and, and moving forward to have an important exhibition of this African-American artist in Washington and then buying the first work by Gilliam to go into a museum. Yeah, that's why um, for me, I was having a conversation with a young artist last night 
and I was, you know, just talking to him about um, the status of, of Sam Gillen in relation to DC artists. And he was like, I never heard of him. And um, for me, what I've seen is that um, oftentimes from an African American perspective, one person can be taken and can be made an exception and no one else gets the opportunities that this, you know, this exception individual gets. And, um, and I believe like it's a huge gap as far as local African American artists uh, being recognized and exhibited and seen and heard in the just the local art scene. I'm not even talking about nationally, um, because Sam Gillum is 85. And you think about who are the predecessors to him, it's like a vacuum, right? So yes. that's why going back to the painting um, on the outskirts of the four corners of the painting that I did with the logo, you see these folk art abstract black figures. I don't figures. know if anybody can see them, but there are these little figures on the corners of the painting, aren't there? Right. So for me, um, that represented the not just the, uh, the black art presence being kept on the fringes of the local art scene, mm -hmm. but just local black art, right? Um, Cause it's okay, it's a great thing that Sam had a one man show and it's commendable, but how many native DC artists have had the opportunity to even be a part of a group show in the Phillips, in the Krieger, in the Smithsonian 20 some institutions. And um, so that's why I, I put that in the painting. And then the letters of the Phillips in the painting was cut out, or our collage just cut out the Wall Street Journal. Right. And I did that intentionally because um, it represents the monetary, the, the commercial part of the art world. And, um, and I strategically put the crown over top of the Phillips name because um, in the monet monetization of the, art, the fine art world, um, with this thing of being a black artist, and if you do a particular type of, a type of art, such as myself, then you're considered like bossy art. That's just the only frame of reference, right? right. And I've read and I've listened to a TED talk about the danger of the single nerve, right? right? So if you do this type of art that I do, then the only frame of reference that people have for you is Basquiat. And people have taken the crown that Basquiat have done and people, you know, they they uh, repeat the crown. And, but for me, when I, when I do the crown, a lot of times in my artwork, I like to put her story in it instead of his story. And that's why I put the crown over top of Philip's name because when you study the history of how women were compelled to take the last names of their husbands and their last name get forgotten was because under Roman law, right? Um, once a woman was married to a man, then she became his property. So she took his last name and she couldn't inherit or anything like that. And everything went to the man. So even though I recognize Phillips and with his name in bold with the Wall Street Journal collage, um, I wanted to put the crown with the woman inside the crown over top of that to show the, um, that women, you know, they can transcend above the, uh, a lot of these traditions that we still honor today, knowingly or unknowingly, even coming down to the, how the woman name becomes forgotten and just becomes a maiden name, right? And the man name stands, right? So. And then the fringes, as I said, is the others, those who are other that kept on the fringes of this commercial fine art world. Um, all of that was my ideas in the painting. I made that background like abstract colors because uh, sometimes the art world can just be chaotic, but it's beautiful though. It's a beautiful chaos. And it has been so kind to me and, and, and so generous. And um, I'm just so honored, you know. This is like my over intellectualized way of explaining my painting. But, um, you know, I'm just so honored to have the platform and, 
to be able to stand with so many other talented artists um, before me uh, who've been in, 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 in you know, the district and have never had the opportunity even to speak or contribute their artwork to this institution. So I, I stand or I sit, as I should say, in honor and in gratitude to them because there's so many great mentors, um, women and men in the art world and outside the art world who have contributed to me being here today, so. thrilled that we're able to go and you know bring you you know closer to us at the Phillips and that you are participating in this you know milestone year for us you know uh, the centennial year for us it's you know I'm fascinated and so appreciated that you spoke to these figures that are on your logo because I was wondering about them and noticed that they were in the four corners of the of your composition. And so that's very interesting to kind of think about what you were trying to um, say in this logo, um, because it seems to me that that is something that is really um, an essential part of your work is that it really combines images and words in a powerful way that does have a very distinct message you know, in the work, you know, and, and I'm really um, very interested in, you know, the kind of role that women have played to, you know, your personal story is such a remarkable one, you know, of an individual who was incarcerated as a kid uh, and has, you know, done such an amazing, you know, transformation of confidence. That is the thing that really impresses me about you, Halim, is how you could have matured into this incredibly confident, articulate man, you know, after spending, you know, half your life, you know, behind bars. And did you do anything with the visual arts while you were um, incarcerated when you were in prison? Um, I've never sketched, I've never drawn, I've never painted anything visual until the quarantine in March of last year. So everything that I've done um, up until that point was literature driven, po poet, spoken word. Um, right literature, essay writing, letter writing, um, never, I never thought I would be a visual artist. Well, it's like, you are incredibly talented, you know, you are remarkable and it seems like you're, um, you layer all these different uh, ideas into your, you know, painting. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm also fascinated by this, I, you know, um, you have this message about love and humanity and trying to, you know, find the way to bring people together uh, in this, you know, very difficult moment that we're living in. And you have a work on view at the Four Seasons Hotel, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and um, I'm just looking for, it's called The Audacity to See. Right. You know, and I, you know, I find that such a kind of wonderful title. Mm -hmm. You know, this idea of seeing is like such uh, an embedded idea in the Phillips, you know, that getting to know artists, sharing what they can, how they see the world, um, and we meeting them at least halfway, if not more, can give us a whole new way of kind of understanding the world around us. Uh, and you mentioned about Marjorie Phillips, you know, that she was an artist. Mm -hmm. um, Duncan Phillips, uh, he was a master at words, you know, you know, writing was really his skill. Mm -hmm. And he was very good at that craft. But he, um, he was jealous of Marjorie's skill to paint. 
Mm. You know, and he would, he encouraged her to continue to paint because it was um, who she was. And, but he would watch her paint. Sometimes she would have to um, lock the door of her studio to mm. keep him from bothering her. He tried to paint himself um, uh, and he was not very skilled at it. Mm -hmm. But for you, um, do you think that the writing or the, or the painting, if one is more important or more kind of your, uh, your best way of communicating or do they have kind of equal merit in your, in your artistic well, for me, for me, um, I have a similar situation to Duncan. Like, I'm very envious of my wife's ability to paint. It was my wife who suggested that we stop at the paint store to get paint and who taught me like how to wet my brush and, you know, things of that nature. And my wife has the ability to take months to complete works. And I just don't have that type of patience. Um, mm -hmm. work. So for me, um, and I remember when I started painting, what people don't know, half of the paintings that I've sold through the galleries, my wife has done the background color to those paintings. Mm -hmm. um, she just doesn't care for recognition. And I come over top of her colors, her, her, her sense of style and color. So I remember when I first started, my background was very monochromatic. Yeah. And my wife said, let me start doing your background for you. And mm. that's when I started selling paintings, right? Uh -huh. and, um, and I tell that story all the time because as I said about the Phyllis paintings that I believe that my strength is in the articulation of the work and maybe in the subject matter and the text that I place on the work. Mm -hmm. But my sense of style with color, um, and you know that I developed that that came from my wife, and um, she just don't care about recognition. And you know, so for me, uh, having her in the house during the quarantine, she didn't have to go to work, and I had just received a, a grant from Agnes Gunn, the Art for Justice Fund. There you go. We were talking about Agnes earlier. Yes. So through. Me uh, being an entrepreneur and a performance spoken word artist, all of my performances were counseled. So a large part of my income was done. But that grant that I received from Agnes Gunn was the seed capital um, that I needed to invest into my visual art. And my wife was like my in-home tutor. So I think now just recently, um, I can say like the application of my work is starting to come, come even with the articulation of it, I still believe that what adds the most equity value to my work is, is how I articulate it. Well, I think that's fantastic to learn that you have this kind of wonderful relationship with your wife, who's, who's like your partner and in your, she's like your spark to kind of, you know, get you thinking about working, you know, two dimensionally and that you have this capacity to kind of transform your thoughts, you know, visually, mm -hmm. as well as with words. Um, and, and it just speaks about this kind of partnership that can exist between uh, individuals that, you know, who are either, you know, marital partners or friends or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, mentor and and student to kind of, you know, craft these kind of, you know, inspirational, you know, uh, partnerships to kind of create wonderful things. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, uh, Duncan Phillips was always very um, supportive of Marjorie. He never wanted her to stop painting. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a hundred years ago, it was not um, in vogue. That's right. That's yeah. absolutely right. You know, a, I, a young woman when she got married was supposed to kind of take her identity and and push it aside, and make herself into you know a wife, a mother, mm -hmm. you know, and in the supportive role, 
and you know, Duncan recognized that she had her own artistic identity that he didn't want to rob her of. And he, you know, we have um, on the fourth floor of the, of the house, the Phillips collection, um, he built her an artist studio mm -hmm. so that she could, you know, have a place when they were living in the house in the 1920s where she could go um, and just spend time every day, you know, um, in her studio working. Uh, and, you know, that's a pretty um, unusual thing, you know, in the 1920s um, to find. And uh, she, she, I tried to paint every day. You know, that was something that was so much a part of her. And I'm sure that, you know, um, your wife must have recognized that there was this creative spark in you that wanted to go and kind of find a visual outlet for what you were, you know, um, writing and uh, doing, you know, with words that you could incorporate that into, you know, painting. Right. Yeah, um, I just think that for me, um, my, like I said earlier, I don't say it just to say it, my greatest support and ideas most of the time always come from women. So uh, I just, I'm not ashamed to public, publicly admit it. I don't think it should be any shame attached to it. I don't think any uh, gender constructions should be attached to just great wisdom. You know, it's just these social constructions that we have with race, class, gender, creed, sexuality, age, disability, that we use to create those others that I put on the four corners of the painting. And that they represent more than just blacks, but all of the people, the human beings who are other, you know, through the filters that we put on um, our spirit and our soul to see the world in, 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 a, in a way that's um, indifferent, you know, mm -hmm. to the human condition. And that's why, I named the show and the exhibit um, the audacity to see. Yes. Because the audacity to hope requires an inner vision, mm -hmm. right? Um, to see something that's not there. And I think that um, to see with love, especially in Washington, D.C., at such a divisive political time, um, takes a tremendous amount of you know, courage to just have the audacity just to be uh, at peace with oneself and to see from a space of love and not to um, resonate with the divisiveness and the partisanship and the, and, and the, and the anger and you know, the, the politics. So um, when you can transcend that from a place of fearless love, yeah. then I think that you can, you can, um, you can really see, you know, you'd be surprised at, and, uh, the things that you see when you see with your heart and not with your, your, your eyes, you know, so. Exactly. I think you've really found such a kind of important message to share with people. Uh, and we need that message terribly today. It's such an important thing to go and find these ways to unite us, you know, emotionally. Um, and not um, always find these kind of ways to separate us. Uh, and, and I, you know, as I say, you know, your story, your personal story, Halim, is so remarkable and inspiring. And uh, I have to ask you this, that, you know, how long have you been married? Um. September the 4th would be two years. So I came home in March of 2019 and six months later, I, I was murdered. So going on like almost two years now. Well, it sounds like it was like a perfect kind of, you know, opportunity for you to kind of, you know, find a new way to kind of step forward, you know, with a partner, you know, in your life. Uh, I shy away from the word perfect 
I believe like in my pain sometimes I put perfectionism, utopian illusion. Mm. But um, but I understand the sentiments of what you mean. For me, it's just a it's a blessing for anybody to to have the audacity to see that in spite of me being labeled a super predator and a menace to society and you know a felon, um, to see that I'm something more and to have the audacity to um, to still love me, you know, um, because a lot of people could be afraid of me because it's so many um, mysterious misconceptions or just assumptions that people have of someone who goes inside. We know how inhumane our prison uh, system is. Mm -hmm. So to put a child in, into that type of environment for 22 years, I think people will have a reasonable expectation that um, that you would be severely damaged. Um, but I, I found love in it for myself and others and um, love was able to, to keep me whole, you know, and, and to keep me warm in and, and, and cold places and to give me light on dark situations. And I know that it's, it's through love that I have the confidence to be myself and, and to access these platforms and to articulate my, my trauma and my tragedies in a loving way and not from a, a space of anger or rage, you know. So it's a, it's a blessing, you know, to have anyone to love me. And, and, I, and I know my wife, uh, she has a lot of patience, you know, because artists, we can be quirky, you know, in our confidence. <laughs> you can be quirky, it's true. Yeah. You know, but, but, but we all can be quirky. It's, you yeah. know, it's not just unique to, you know, visual artists or, you know, writers, but yes, creative people can be, you know, um, uh, kind of challenging. Yeah. I see we have two questions. I don't, I don't want us to um, run over our time before we, we answer the questions. I didn't see the question. I just see a two right there. So. I uh, <laughs> was just about to come back and, and so that we could address these questions, but I wanted to give you guys some time to talk. Uh, I And I will tell you, we've done, for this logo project, we've done seven conversations so far this year. Um, and this has probably been my favorite one uh, mm. out of the seven that we've done so far. So I, I wanted to give you guys more time because I was being selfish and I, I wanted you to talk more. Uh, but we do have a couple questions and so I would love to address them. Uh, the first one is coming from a staff member, I believe. At least mm. there are things in the question that lead me to believe as a staff member. It just says, thank you so much for your work and for the feminist take you have on this. I want to let you know that we are digitizing the correspondence of Marjorie Phillips. Um, so obviously more information out there for us to dig through uh, when this person is done doing that process. Um, but their question is, uh, you mentioned Dolly was the first member of the board who wasn't a family member. How did this go over and when did she join? Well, I can't tell you that I know absolutely the answers to that, but what I can um, say is that uh, when Lachlan Phillips took over responsibility as director in 1972. Uh, he knew that he had to create a, a real board of trustees. You know, the, um, his father had created a board of trustees back in 1921, but it, it never really was active. And Lachlan knew that uh, an, an active engaged board was essential to make um, the Phillips, uh, a museum that could go the distance. And so uh, he obviously tapped into, I mean, he was a lifelong Washingtonian and he, he is, for anyone who, who may be new to the area, um, he was one of the founders of Washingtonian Magazine. So, you know, he, he had a lot and he was with, um, he was also, with the CIA after World War II. So he had a lot of people in the community that he could turn to. And so um, Polly Fritchie, you know, even when I was like just joining the Phillips in the mid nineties, I heard her name. She was still actively part of the kind of 
um, gala events we had that were fundraisers. So I think that her presence was accepted and understood. Um, there, I had mentioned earlier that she was kind of a socialite and I didn't mean that in a demeaning way. I meant that there are, um, Washington has a history of women holding important roles in a social manner because people would, um, they would have uh, events, dinners, salons, if you will, where they would bring people together into their homes and create, forge friendships and create opportunities for people to get to know each other and become committed to um, different uh, cultural institutions in the city. And this is clearly the role that um, Polly Fritchie, you know, was able to um, do with tremendous success um, for the Phillips and for other institutions in the city as well. And I suspect there was no um, problem with her um, fulfilling that role. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not aware that there's ever been a kind of prejudice against, you know, um, you know, when Vicki Sant became, you know, chairman of the board, you know, in the late 90s, um, you know, she was, her role was completely, you know, uh, understood, accepted, and uh, she was very well respected. And, and so I think that um, it was a very interesting kind of moment. And, and we have transitioned now to where, you know, we have our own, you know, uh, female director who's been leading us into the 21st century um, and, you know, this kind of uh, embrace of women performing um, behind the scenes and in leadership roles at the Phillips is something that, you know, is well understood, you know, within our, you know, community and our institution, you know. Yeah, no, totally. I think you can see it through you see it through the museum today, right? Yeah. And, and just like who is not just on our board of directors, but who is leading our departments and, and taking the charge of the museum itself, right? Like it's right. Like, they've a really strong role in who we are as an institution. Right, exactly. Uh, our yeah. next question is for Halim. And uh, this comes from Gabriella and says, I'm quite curious to hear more about the collaborations between you and your wife. Um, mm -hmm. News to me, as for like the paintings, does she have an art background? Mm. Her art background, uh, what was not like formal, she had an MFA or anything like that. Um, I just think that she took arts and craft more serious. Um, mm. It was something that was taught in the schools and like extracurricular camps and things of that nature. And so when it came time for me to, to venture into this, I think she more held on to that. Whereas with me, I've always been like a literature or word um, person. It was more cerebral than tangible in my uh, creative expression. So um, a lot of times what, what has happened is um, first, I think it was just her just like, I remember I tried to hang a painting up in the living room at our first house and she was like, no, you'll, <laughs> you can hang it in the basement, right? And then I remember, as, you know, she, I had, I had a uh, Washington City paper asked me to do a cover for them. Um, and I did a paint called The Revolution Will Be Digitized and a spoken word track with that um, that was produced by Tone P. But my wife was like, oh, 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 let me do the background. But she did the background colors and I just wrote The Revolution Will Be Digitized and Oil Stick. So, um, and then now with, to be honest with you, I'm at a place now where the demand is kind of like uh, exceeding my capacity to create. Uh, you know, mm. so sometimes I just, you know, I don't have the capacity, so I need her. Like when people want to commission work, so, you know, I have these shows coming up and I'd be like, hey, they need a painting in, the, in, 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 in at the gallery for the Four Seasons show tomorrow. 
I'm out, you know, and about and taking care of business and beatings and, you know, can you do my background for me? And she'd be like, sure. And she'd come and, and then when I see it, I'd be like, wow, like, this is just amazing, you know? And then I just hit it over top with, with, with what I do with the imagery and the text. And it's just like, a, um, it's a beautiful collaboration, but she actually has her first um, exhibit, local exhibit coming up um, with the Shayla Mitchell pop-up gallery. Um, I think July 29th. So I'm excited because she has like supported me and all that I've done along the way. So now it's just like, and I didn't even want to exhibit there. I just like, I just want to see her work exhibit and see her step into her, um, her confidence because what I realized with a lot of um, women artists who I know, Tati has done a great job of destroying their confidence. They have the skill. You know, it's something that has happened. I was gone as a child and I came back as an adult. So I'm learning um, about the things like Me Too and things, all these things that happen in the corporate world and, um, and it's just in a world that destroys women's confidence of being. So um, and my wife always says that my greatest asset is that I'm fearless. But I just want her to be fearless too because I believe she's a dope artist. And she, she, um, she can add, she can contribute to the local and, and the national global art scene with her skill set. So you mentioned that currently she doesn't, as she does your, as she does your backgrounds, uh, she doesn't see it as some form of collaboration, correct? Like, or she doesn't, she doesn't see it as this way of, of wanting credit for that no. thing down your backgrounds. Do you think that'll change in the future? Like, are you excited to I see? I hope it more, does. Are you excited to see more of this interaction as a collaboration between the two of you of, of creating work together? I hope it does because um, I know my gallery wants her to, and um, they was like informing me about the history of like the Coon and the other uh, art couples who, who did incredible things. So just. Um, for me, I just, you know, I, I, I want to see her shine and, and uh, you know, step into her recognition, which is deserved, you know, so um, I hope it does. And I think the beginning of it will be, you know, her being a part of this group exhibit at the State of Mitchell Gallery, um, July 29th. I know we're a little over in time, but there is a question in the chat um, more about your performances and and mm -hmm. how you if there's a way that people can kind of see this merging of your visual art and your performing art or if, if people are able to just kind of see your performing art period like where where are you performing currently or are you as things are opening back up are you doing any poetry readings any readings in well, i have a, um, a opera production coming up in 22 and 23 and it's about my life and, and the life of Mama Lou Stewart, another childhood friend who was uh, given a life sentence as a, as a child. And Kim Kardashian helped him come home. And um, so opera, Beth Morrison Projects, an opera production company. So, so far we have a theater in LA, in New York City, mm -hmm. Boston at the Emerson Theater, and then we have the Kennedy Center. So, uh, so the, the opera production will be, be uh, shown at the Kennedy Center. So um, that'll be like the next big performance will be um, a big stage will be there. But um, as other spoken word performances does come up, just follow me on Instagram. I, I, I'm a serial Instagram, so I'll post what's, what's your What's your Instagram so that we can all find you? My Instagram is at uh, Harleen Flowers, H-A-L-I-M-F-L-O-W-E-R-S. That's at Harleen Flowers in my Art page on Instagram is at Ideanaires, I-D-E-A-L-L-I-O-N-A-I-R-E-S, at Ideanaires. Beautiful. I think that's great. Uh, Sue, are you on Instagram? Can people find you on Instagram, Sue? No, you're not going to find me. I am so bad. I mean, <laughs> Halim, I am so impressed that you have, like, just jumped into the social media world here. Yeah. You know? I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and Halim, you're also doing a, for, for those of you who are in attendance, uh, you're also doing a live painting session at the yeah. Four Seasons the Saturday, correct? Saturday, yeah. This Saturday is. during brunch. So if there's still tickets available, you wow. guys can, can, can meet them in person and see them there. 
Um, Sue, do you have any other questions for Halim tonight? No, Halim, I just, I'm just so happy to have met you, you know, and I hope I get the chance to meet you in person soon. You know, yeah. it's, you know, I really, you know, enjoy the work that you're doing and, and talking to you tonight has been a real pleasure. It's been an honor to, to learn so much from you as well about the Phillips. Thank you. It's been great.